Here now, Cherie Polello. Good evening to you and welcome to the Democratic primary debate in the race for Ohio's governor. We are in Finkelman Auditorium this evening here on Miami's, Miami's University's campus uh, in Middletown, the Middletown campus. Tonight we're going to hear from four of the Democratic candidates. These are four candidates who have agreed to work with the Dem Democratic Party and agreed to be a part of our debate here this evening. Now, in addition to the Democratic Party, we are also partnering tonight with Miami University. We're represented tonight with Dr. John Foran on our panel. Thanks so much for being here along with the Journal News, represented by Michael Pittman. Our very own WLWT News Live's Curtis Fuller is also with us here tonight, and he is in the audience and is going to be answering questions from the audience. Our candidates are going to have one minute to answer your questions. Now, some of these questions are going to be for our entire group here tonight. Others will be specific questions directed at one particular candidate. We're going to begin with opening statements. We drew lots before the debate tonight. Richard Cordray will give the first opening statement. And Mr. Cordray, you have one minute. I know we can make a better Ohio. Betty Sutton and I are focused on the kitchen table issues, access to affordable health care, improved education and training, and above all, jobs, more and better jobs. We will end the backward-looking Republican rule. We stand for an Ohio that is tolerant and inclusive and will embrace the talents of everyone. We will govern, Betty and I, proudly on progressive principles. I've been elected statewide twice as treasurer and attorney general, and I've built a record of real results. We helped small businesses create jobs and helped thousands of people save their homes from foreclosure. We took on Wall Street and brought back $2 billion for Ohio retirees. We defended worker rights. President Obama appointed me to lead the Consumer Bureau, and we put $12 billion that was wrongly taken back in people's pockets. Betty and I will set an example for America of how a government can work not just for some of the people, but for all of the people. Join us to fulfill this vision. Thank you. Cordray, thank you. Bill O'Neill, your opening statement. I'm Bill O'Neill. Many of you know I was the only Democrat elected to the Ohio Supreme Court in the last 30 years. And I'm here to tell you tonight that the time to legalize marijuana in Ohio is now. I'm a retired Lieutenant Colonel, United States Army, and I'm here to tell you that we can and we must rebuild our mental health hospital network so that we can reach down to the least fortunate members of our society. And I'm a pediatric emergency room nurse. And I'm saying we have got to do something about these 5,000 people who are dying of an opioid overdose every year. But tonight I'm here to rescue the Ohio electoral process. You have been told that this is a two-way race, two-man race, Richard and Dennis, and the only subject we're going to talk about is guns. And I'm here to tell you that stops today. We're going to talk about marijuana, mental health, and saving lives. I'm Mr. Bill O'Neill. I'm the next governor of Ohio. Thank you so much. Mr. Schiavone. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. My name is Joe Schiavone. I'm from Youngstown. You know, I grew up working uh, various labor jobs in high school and in college. I fought in the Golden Gloves in high school. I went away to Ohio University and Capital Law School. When I came back, I started spending time with the Big Brothers and Big Sisters. I started practicing law as a worker's comp lawyer and advocating for workers across the Mahoning Valley. I was fortunate enough to then start in the legislature. In 2009, I started representing the Mahoning Valley. And I decided that I'm running for governor because we need change. I can't sit back and watch the same Democrats run for different positions. We need somebody that's going to step out. We need somebody that's going to be bold. And if we as Democrats are relying on this blue wave that is supposedly coming, we don't catch it unless somebody's there working, energizing people, getting people fired up, and giving people something to believe in. Stephanie Dodd and I are fighters with real perspectives and real plans based on the jobs we have today. Mr. Me as a state senator, her as a state school board member. I appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. I look forward to the questions. Thank you so much. Mr. Kucinich. 
Good evening, everyone. My fellow Ohioans, this is an opportunity to take this state in a new direction. Years ago, when I was mayor of Cleveland, by eliminating waste, fraud, and abuse, I was able to cut city spending by 10% without reducing services. And the programs that I'm going to talk about tonight will cost money, but the way we get it is get rid of the corruption. Right now, Ohio is a cesspool of corruption. That state capital needs to be cleaned out and to break the cycle of corruption. We can have health care for all if we break the cycle of corruption. We can have clean water and clean air if we break the cycle of corruption. We can get rid of the NRA's influence and be free of assault weapons if we break the corruption. We can have $15 minimum wage if we break the corruption. We can have the kind of Ohio that we want and the kind of Ohio that we have a right and, have des and deserve. I'm running for governor to deliver that kind of Ohio to you. Thank you. I want to get right into things tonight. And our first question is in regards to perhaps the most important topic facing our country and our state right now, and that is gun control. There is a new bipartisan bill. It offers stricter measures. It's being proposed right now by Ohio's current governor, John Kasich. So my question to you is, do you support this bill? And what changes, if any, would you make? We begin tonight with Mr. Cordray. You have one minute. We need to reduce the gun violence in America. As a parent of twin teenagers, I see that and feel that as much as anyone in our society. That's why we have proposed the strongest and most comprehensive plan to reduce the gun violence in society uh, today. It involves three things. First, tightening the gun laws. That includes universal background checks. It, it includes any modifications to legal firearms that would make them illegal weapons, such as bump stocks and high-capacity magazine clips. It involves a plan for school safety that is similar to that proposed by law enforcement around Ohio. And it involves things that the governor can do without the legislature to intervene with local officials in the gang violence on our streets and the criminal acts on our streets that consume thousands of lives every year. These are all things that have to be done. Some of my parts of my plan, the NRA opposes. I know that. But they're the right thing to do for Ohio, and I will fight for those things to get them done. Mr. Cordray, I want to follow up there. Can you specifically address assault weapons? And would you support a ban on assault weapons like Mr. Kucinich has proposed? 30 seconds. So again, I think the problem is broader than just one slice of it. Uh, we had 7,000 people killed last year in America with firearms, handguns, and less than 400 killed with rifles. That is a slice of things. I understand that. There are other things that are more immediately achievable that we can do working with the legislature. This legislature, I understand, has done nothing. Did nothing after Sandy Hook, did nothing after Las Vegas, did nothing after Parkland. Hasn't moved on anything. I will get them to move and we will make change. There are also things that I will do as governor that don't involve the legislature and don't require the legislature that have been shown to reduce the violence around the country and on our city streets, as in Boston and St. Louis. These are all parts of the broadest and most comprehensive hey, plan on guns that any of the there. candidates in this race. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, uh, Mr. O'Neill. I didn't realize it was going to happen so soon. As you can see, that was a yes or no question you asked Rich. Do you or do you not support Dennis's ban on assault weapons? My answer is no. I'm a retired Supreme Court justice. The Second Amendment gives a right to own the weapons, but the Second Amendment also gives the rest of us the right to reasonable regulations. I've said repeatedly, background checks, and more, more directly, if you want to own an assault weapon in Ohio, then you're going to have to take it down, in my opinion, to your local chief of police once a year and register it. Thank you. Mr. Schiavone. Tomorrow, I'll be testifying in the Senate about a red flags bill that I brought forward a couple of weeks back. It's very simple stuff, and this might be what you were referring to with Governor Kasich because he did talk about that he was in support of this. And so we rolled it out in the Senate. It's simple. It says if there's a dangerous situation and family and law enforcement thinks that people are in danger, either hurting themselves or others, 
You can go to the court, the court will issue an order, and you can temporarily seize those firearms for 14 days until you figure out what's going on. That's a starting point. But we have to shore up these gun show loopholes. We have to make sure that mental health is a part of the background check. We have to make kids feel safe in school again. You know, my wife Margaret and I have two little boys that are three and five. I don't want them to grow up in a place where they feel scared every, sing every single time they're walking in the doors at school. And so it's about giving the school districts the flexibility and the resources to shore up their schools at the same time dealing with gun violence. And at the end of the day, as governor, I would sign a ban on assault weapons. Mr. Schiavone, thank you so much. Mr. Kucinich, you have one minute. To answer your question. I think it's uh, important that Governor Kasich switch his position on guns and is now for some regulation of guns. That's important. It's a step in the right direction. You also asked about assault weapons. Um, t my running mate, Tara Samples, and I are leading the way in Ohio to an assault weapons ban. Now, there's no other candidate on this, on this stage who is willing to say that. As a matter of fact, Mr. Cordray, as Attorney General, took steps to repeal the city of Cleveland's assault weapons ban. And that affected every other city in this state. In addition to that, at the U.S. Supreme Court, in a case called McDonald versus Chicago, he took steps to nullify not only Chicago's uh, uh, regulations on guns, but also it had an effect nationally. The people of Ohio have a right to safe communities. You have a right to, when you drop your children off to school, that you never have to worry about whether they're going to be safe. We have a right to be safe in our public spaces and not have to worry when we're at a mall or a church or a shopping area that we're going to be safe. I intend to break that cycle of corruption that the NRA has sponsored in Columbus and ban assault weapons, and I'm the only candidate running statewide who's willing to say that. Mr. Thank Kucinich, you. Mr. Kucinich, thank you. Our next question comes from the Journal News and Mr. Michael Pittman. Uh, here in Butler County, also to the south in Hamilton County, um, we've seen more opioid deaths year after year, um, an increase in that. Similar to across the state, many communities, many local communities are struggling to deal with the effects of opioid addiction. What are your plans to tackle this issue? Mr. O'Neill, you have the first response. As I said in my opening, I'm a pediatric emergency room nurse. With these hands, I have saved a child from an overdose. There is no question that once upon a time in Ohio, an emergency room had a place to send a kid that had an addiction problem. It was a state mental hospital. We boarded them all up in the 80s, and the theory was that they would go somewhere else to be treated. I am unequivocal in saying we need more hospitals and less prisons. We need to legalize marijuana, which will, by the Colorado model, <coughs> reduce heroin use by 25 percent, will reduce heroin deaths by 25 percent. That's a thousand people a year that don't die. And it will re uh, produce $500 million in sales taxes. I hate to say this on a college campus, but we know there's marijuana sales going on tonight. You take the money from marijuana sales, you regulate it, and you open a world-class network of mental health hospitals to treat these poor victims. Thank you so much, Mr. O'Neill. Mr. Schiavone? Yeah, every place that I've been to in the last year, you have a meeting, they say, we feel like we are the epicenter of this problem. And that shows how deep of a problem it is. You know, I've been working on legislation in the past to allocate 10% of the rainy day fund. Currently, we have $2.5 billion in a rainy day fund. So allocating 10% of that to invest in educating kids, to invest in law enforcement so they have the tools in the ground, and the largest portion into children's services, into addiction services, into mental health, into giving people second chances. You know, this isn't about just throwing away people. Most people that are dealing with this, this addiction took the drug exactly like the doctor told them to. They were a workers' comp client of mine. They were a high school athlete like my running mate, Stephanie. Her sister passed away from an opioid overdose, and she got prescribed this medication when she got hurt as a high school athlete. These people need help, and as government officials, we need to be there to help them. Mr. Schiavone, thank you, Mr. Kucinich. And again, the question is, what are your plans to tackle this epidemic? Thank you very much. Uh, Tara Samples and I have uh, spoken about this opioid epidemic all over the state. 
because it is the one issue that is devastating families. Think about what happens when you have an addict in the family and they can't get treatment. Insurance companies won't cover long-term treatment. We have a health care system that basically doesn't provide for people who need special care. We need a health care system. And this is where I intend to move boldly on behalf of the people of Ohio. Have a program similar to Medicare for All where everyone's covered, which includes dealing with people's addictions and help them get the long-term care they need. Mental health care has to be given. You have to take a multidisciplinary approach like they do at the Veterans Hospital in Cleveland. We can beat this opioid epidemic, but we have to support people. We, we have to hot, you know, give people hospitalization, not put them in prison. We have to be compassionate with this and also wise. And we have to believe that we can do it using the resources of the state for people who need help. Mr. Kucinich, thank you. thank you. Mr. Cordray. I think it's important to start by recognizing that Republicans have been in charge of the state government for the last eight years, and they've done nothing effective to address this crisis. They ignored it for a number of years and wished it would go away. So it's on their watch. Here's what I would do differently from the Republicans. I've been out to speak to law enforcement across the state, and they have said we need to get the illegal drugs off our streets, heroin, fentanyl, and meth in the rural areas. But they've also said, they have said, we can't arrest our way out of this crisis. We have to have prevention and treatment programs, and they have to be robust. And that's the only way we're going to solve this problem in Ohio. That means that we can't have a state legislature, as we have had, that is fighting local governments and taking their money, because these services are delivered at the local level, mental health and drug addiction services. We also cannot take away the Medicaid expansion, as the Republican governor candidates want to do and will do, and think that we're going to fight this crisis. We have to protect those resources. Finally, using the pharmacy and medical boards, we need to stop the overprescription of these painkillers. Mr. Cordray, thank you. Now to a related question tonight from Dr. John Foran. Thank you. Um, according to recent reports, Ohio currently ranks last in the nation in the provision of state funding for child protective services. Even with only, caseloads are exploding, but the state currently only provides about nine cents of every dollar that's spent for child protection. Uh, as governor, how would you address this ongoing challenge that's really devastating to a lot of local areas? and? Um, if you would increase funding, where does that funding come from? Mr. Schiavone. Nothing is more important than our kids. And so we need to start refocusing and reprioritizing. You know, since I've been in the Senate for the last nine years, the goal from the Republican legislature and Governor Kasich is to tax cut first. But when you tax cut first, you don't have any money to invest in your people. You don't have any money to invest in opportunities. You don't have any money to invest in those vital services that our locals desperately need. And so that's why people across the state see a levy for their schools, and then they see a levy for their senior centers, then they see a levy for their roads and bridges, and an increased sales tax at the local level because they're trying to scrape it together. So it's about reprioritizing, and this is not a Republican-Democrat issue anymore because there's plenty of Republican legislators that have their locals saying, why are you doing this to us? We need to work together and reinvest in the future, and this is just part of that. So it's about reprioritizing, getting rid of those loopholes for business and the tax cuts, and reinvesting in our people. Mr. Schiavone, thank you. Mr. Kucinich. You raised the question about children's protective services, and what do we do to make sure that children who are trapped in a situation where a parent or parents may run afoul of a justice system or they may be on uh, uh, opioid addicted. These children are getting lost. And so we have to have a state that really cares for children. Those budgets have to be brought up and fully funded, number one. Number two, we have to make sure that there's a safe space for children if somebody in their family or if their parents can't function. There's more of it going on than we talk about. And so that means, first of all, I mentioned health care for all, make sure the addictions are being treated, or any, uh, also enabling people to get out of prison quicker so they're not stuck in prison when they should be caring for their children. Also enabling a safe space program in our schools so the children will have somebody to be with 
we need more after school programs to enable children to have more contact with people. That's, a, uh, that's just the opening of this discussion. Mr. Thank Kucinich, you. where would the funding come from? We all know we need more programs. We know we need to do something to help these kids. I mean, the heroin epidemic increased 30% last year just in Hamilton County. So where does the money come from to help these children? Um, I said in my opening statement that when I was mayor of Cleveland, I was able to cut spending by 10%. If we cut the state's spending by 10%, get rid of the waste, fraud, abuse, and corruption, we'll have billions of dollars to be able to pour into health care. I also agree with my friend, uh, uh, Mr. O'Neill. You know, if we legalize marijuana, license it, and, uh, uh, and tax it, you get money to come back in for those people who are opposed to it, let me tell you, and go to a rock concert, it's already been legalized. But I, I think that we have to recognize that the money is there for everything that we want. It's just the corruption that exists in our state capital does not permit the, people to, the people's needs to get taken care of. Thank you so much. That was 30 seconds. Thank Mr. You. Cordray, you have one minute. So budgets are about priorities, but one of the things we've seen again and again is this state legislature keeps taking money from local governments for its own <coughs> ideological purposes. Tax cuts directed at those who need them least. That's the wrong policy for our state. It's trickle-down economics and has not produced the growth and jobs that were promised. We have two things right now that are affecting children dramatically. One is the opioid crisis, and it's leaving lots of families dysfunctional and children thrown onto our school systems who are expected to cope with parenting those children, not just teaching those children. And we also have a crying need for criminal justice reform in this state. We are warehousing low-level addicts who are not criminals in our prisons and our jails. It is costing us tremendous amounts of money we could save if we had criminal justice reform, and it tears apart families and leaves people with no future. Because when people come out of the prisons for, for addict addiction, they cannot get jobs, they cannot get on occupational licensing paths. These are all things we need to do to improve the quality of life in our families and our communities. Mr. Cordray, thank you. Mr. O'Neill, you have 60 seconds. In 1968, I was a volunteer at the Athens County Children's Home. We used to have 88 of those in the, in the state, and much like the mental health hospitals, we just closed them. We just closed them and figured the kids would handle themselves. I was a volunteer at the uh, orphanage, call it an orphanage, it's not a dirty word. I've been a guardian ad litem for abused children, and I have an adopted son. There's nothing more important that we do in a society, and I, I have to agree with Rich. We have, tonight, as we're speaking, 5,000 people in our for-profit prison system who are low-level, nonviolent marijuana offenders. This, I hope, shocks everyone in this audience. We pay $100 million a year to keep marijuana offenders, nonviolent, in jail, in for-profits jails. So if you don't hear me say anything else tonight, it is morally reprehensible for a society to have a for-profit prison system and not take care of their kids. Thank you so much. I want to now turn your attention to our audience and WLWT News 5's Curtis Fuller with our next question. Hi, Curtis. Uh, if you are elected, you will be working with a Republican administration in the White House, which will have just lost a very important GOP stronghold by losing Ohio. So the question is, how will you keep a productive relationship with the Trump administration? We begin with Mr. Kucinich. Challenge the administration on the issues. Show them a better path forward. I'll give you some examples. The president's program for infrastructure rebuilding is wrong. It, need, it, it cannot rely on any privatization. It needs more funding. It, he relies on 200 billion. That wouldn't pay to repair the Brent Spence Bridge. We, or excuse me, two billion would, but that wouldn't pay to meet the infrastructure needs of the Midwest. We need a dialogue with the White House to tell them what the needs are, and that's what a governor has to do. A governor has to state the needs of Ohio, let's rebuild our infrastructure, let's rebuild the Western Hills Viaduct in Cincinnati, let's rebuild our sewer system so people's sewer rates don't go up, 
let's make sure that the needs are met. And I think that if you do that in a way that is logical and straightforward and don't attack someone personally, I think there's always room to be able to make some progress. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cordray. So the job of governor is to lead the state and to work with anyone and everyone to make progress in the state and to stand and fight on principle on things that are going to take us backward. It involves cooperation at two different levels. It involves working with local governments in Ohio. And again, the state government has done that poorly, in my estimation, for the last eight years. We have to be partners with local officials. We have to work with them the way we did in the foreclosure crisis to save thousands of people's homes across this state bringing people together, not dividing them against each other, but bringing them together, listening more, and having people work together to solve problems. I call that the Ohio way. That's important. As for Washington, what we need to do is understand what we need in Ohio and stand up for Ohio. If that means opposing the Trump administration, we need to oppose the Trump administration. If it means working with the Trump administration because they're actually going to do something to help us, we should embrace that. That's what we will do. And on infrastructure, which was mentioned, we we have a phony plan by this administration that is a lot of imaginary money. We need a stronger plan or we're going to have to do it ourselves in Ohio. All right. Thank you so much. And we'll, of course, get to infrastructure here in a few minutes. Mr. O'Neill. You know, I think you judge a man or a woman by their record. I was on the 11th District Court of Appeals where I ended up being selected as the presiding judge by the Republican votes on the court. You know, I know how to work with people, but if you want to talk about a real challenge and if you want to figure out whether the O'Neill plan works, when I was elected to the Ohio Supreme Court in 2012, I was the only Democrat there. I was the only Democrat there for five years. And if you look at the O'Neill record that's now in the history books, I worked extremely well with my Republican colleagues. Uh, the one that asked me not to say this, so I'm going to say it tonight. Other than Paul Pfeiffer, my vote was most prevalent with Chief Justice O'Connor. We got along really well together, and she says, please don't say that on the campaign trail. <laughs> Mr. O'Neill, thank you. Mr. Schiavone. I mean, the question is, what do you do with Trump? You know, I'm used to dealing with tough situations. You know, I was a minority leader in the Ohio Senate for the last three years. And so what politicians forget about is that we're here for all of you, and we're not here for ourselves to make a real rousing speech or poke a, you know, poke a dig at somebody or try to score political points. And so you need a leader that understands that. You need a leader that embraces that and goes to work every single day, just like all of you do, to get the job done. And so it's about always trying to work together first. You know, if a plumber and an electrician don't get along well, but they work for the same builder, they still got to work together to get the house done. But at the end of the day, if you have to fight and you got to dig in, I can do that too. And you got to stand up when your people get pushed. You got to stand up when people are getting taken advantage of. So it's about working first and fighting second to try to get the job done. Thank you so much, my next question is a direct question, and it is for you, Mr. O'Neill. You have run a controversial campaign, and while you were a candidate and still an Ohio Supreme Court justice, you made what some considered an offensive statement regarding women. What would you say to the voters here tonight about those comments that were made on Facebook? This was back in November of 2007 when we were uh, that with the highly charged hashtag MeToo movement. Absolutely highly charged, there's no question, and I think if you look at what I did the following day, I think you judge people by their character. If you look at a 40-year history as a civil rights lawyer, I want to be judged on that. But I made a mistake. And I think what you do when you make a mistake is you own it, you apologize for it, and you move on. That's how I think you, you, you judge a man or a woman. You know, I was angry that day. I've got 40 years of leadership, of equality. I represented women in the Ohio Civil Rights Commission in sexual harassment cases, and I'm losing my mic again. But no, I, I freely, I own what I did. It was a mistake. When you're wrong, you promptly admit it, you move on. Thank you so much. I appreciate you addressing that. Our next question is for uh, Mike Pittman with the Journal News. Mr. Sash, this is for you. Um, since you've been out of Congress, you've been on Fox News, uh, you, you've talked about how you supported 
Donald Trump as far as some of those issues like trade. You've applauded his uh, parts of his uh, inaugural speech. Uh, you even called the Russia investigation a hoax in, in some way, manner. Can you share with your what your views are with Tr Donald Trump, where you agree with him, and where you differ? Yes, and thank you. For 40 years, I've taken a stand for fair trade, and I opposed all the trade agreements that came by when I was in Congress because they didn't have workers' rights, human rights, environmental quality principles. In 16 years in Congress, I led the effort for peace and tried to get them, keep America away from these wars that were based on lies and that have wasted lives and trillions of dollars. When, Dron when Donald Trump in his inaugural gave some uh, uh, homage to that, I thought that was a good thing. Now, today, <clears throat> I mentioned earlier, I don't agree with him on infrastructure. I don't agree with him on a wall. I don't agree with him on the immigration policies. I don't agree with him in that we're so at war in some of these countries. As governor of Ohio, where I agree with the President of the United States, it must involve the aspirations of the people of Ohio. But where I disagree with him, I will have no hesitation to stand up and speak out and to say it, and I never have had a hesitation. Thank you. Mr. Kucinich, thank you so much. I want to go back out to the audience now to another viewer question from Curtis Fuller. Well, Sheree, this question comes from Daniel Trackman. He is from Youngstown, Ohio. He has a question back to gun control. He says he would like to ask this question, talking about proposing new gun laws. He says, what's wrong with the current laws? They're not being fully enforced. He uses this as an example. One requirement for updating the national database about people who are banned from owning a gun. How would you address that? Mr. Cordray, you have 60 seconds. So we certainly need to enforce the existing laws, and where we haven't done that, we're falling short, and we're failing as a society. But I think we have to go further. I have proposed tightening the gun laws in specific respects. I know the NRA opposes that, but they're the right thing to do for Ohio, and I will fight for it. We need universal background checks that will take legislation in the Ohio legislature. We need to ban the bump stocks and high-capacity magazine clips that are increasing uh, the carnage in these mass shootings. These are things that have to be done. They're important. Uh, at the same time, uh, it's important for us to recognize that if we're going to make progress on this, we have to find concrete, practical steps we can take that are actually achievable. People can propose anything that they want to propose, but if they have no real plan for accomplishing it, it won't get us anywhere, and four years from now, we'll look back and say, we got nowhere on this problem. I like to get things done. I like to make change. I like to actually get practical results. That's what we will do with the legislature of Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Cordray. Mr. O'Neill. As a nurse, the first thing you do is assess the problem. I live in a town of 4,000 people. I went to the commander of my VFW post, and then he's a policeman. I said, Chief, how many assault weapons do we have here in Pleasantville? And he said, I have no idea. And I said, Chief, that's wrong. You send police officers into houses, you have an absolute right to know who has an assault weapon, an absolute right. The Second Amendment gives people the right to own a weapon. The Second Amendment gives us, everyone in this auditorium, to come up with reasonable regulations. I say a reasonable regulation is, I want to know where they are. Thank you. Mr. Schiavone? Yeah, this, guns, this issue doesn't have to be an us versus them. It doesn't have to be people that are pro-Second Amendment and that are against the Second Amendment. You know, everybody up here is talking about respecting the Second Amendment, making sure that people can have the firearms at home to protect their family, making sure they can have hunting rifles if they like to go hunting. But at the end of the day, the question was whether or not we need to enforce the laws in the books, and we absolutely do, and I've put forward a lot of legislation on top of that in order to make people feel safer in this state and in this country because we do have a problem. So while we respect that Second Amendment right, we have to address the problem at hand, and we have to stand with these young people that finally have something to believe in in politics. I was at a senior in high school's house last night in Bexley where she had her friends over. We talked about the issue 
this is something that means a lot to them. And when you open the door to talk to them about this, they open the door to all their other ideas as well. And I think it's time we come together and talk through the issue. Thank you, Mr. Kucinich. Let me tell you why young people are fed up with the political system and are going to vote in droves to change it. Because in Columbus, politicians will always commiserate whenever there's a tragedy with assault weapons. Yes, the national database needs to be fixed. That's the answer to that question. But the real issue here in Ohio is whether we're going to have a safe space and have our children safe. On the stage here with me are candidates, Mr. Cordray, an A from the NRA, Mr. Chavoni, a B plus. I'm not sure what Mr. Uh, O'Neill's rating is, but I will tell you this. I'm the only one running for governor who has an F from the NRA because I intend to ban assault weapons with the help of the people. We need to have a safe space for our children. We need to have a safe space for ourselves. If a governor cannot lead to, to insist on that, then what is the state all about? The first reason to have a state is it should be a state of security, a state of, of safety, a state of a safe space. And as governor, I intend to lead the way towards that with the young people who are going to be massively voting in this primary for the only candidate who has taken a stand against assault weapons. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Kucinich. All right, now back to infrastructure. And I, almost all of you have touched on this in some form. And so I want to go back to infrastructure and the study about the Brent Spence Bridge with no solutions. We've done study after study. There's no plan in place right now. I distinctly remember uh, as a journalist standing underneath the Brent Spence Bridge five years ago when President Obama was seeking re-election, swearing that this was going to happen and still nothing. Governor Kasich saying here recently that getting funding, federal funding, for the Brent Spence is about as likely, or as likely I should say, is getting funding or money from the Tooth Fairy. So my question for you is how do you plan to pay for a new Brent Spence bridge, and is it even a priority for you? Let's begin with uh, Mr. O'Neill. I don't know about your bridge, but I do know that the Highway Trust Fund that went into effect back in 54, and President Eisenhower said it was national defense. There's all kinds of money, but I don't know why we spend it the way we do. And the, the reason I say that is that uh, 20 years ago, we thought we should get into high-speed rail in Ohio and start doing construction jobs in transportation, and it went nowhere. And then we got federal funding from the federal government during the Strickland administration for $600 million for rail, and the, the Kasich administration came in. I think they're the first administration in the history of the world to take $600 million worth of construction jobs in infrastructure and send it back to the federal government. So it's a matter of priorities. Okay. I don't think it's a matter of raising new money. It's a matter of priorities. Did you say, let me clarify. Did you say you don't know about the bridge? Do you which, know about which, the Brent Spence bridge? Are you the Brent about? Spence bridge? So it's a, it's a, a huge gateway uh, of travel. Along 7175. And I'm sure I've gone over it many times, but no, uh, I, as a judge, I found myself it is really important for me to talk about things I know about. I don't know about your bridge. All right, thank you so much, Mr. O'Neill. Mr. Schiavone. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a huge issue, and we have to find the money. So I disagree with Justice O'Neill. I mean, it is a matter of resources. And when you tax cut, you don't have the money left to do infrastructure. So you got to be creative. You got to start talking about increasing the gas tax so that we can have the money necessary to invest in new infrastructure programs. You have to talk about combining that with potential tolls. I mean, you have to figure out how you're going to do this. I've also proposed bond issues in order to increase the amount of revenue that we can invest in infrastructure. When you do this and you're creative, you can finally start putting people to work at the same time you're rebuilding our infrastructure. And if you don't have good infrastructure, you're not gonna have businesses that wanna to come to your community. And so it's about time we invest not only in roads and bridges, not only the Brent Spence, but also in broadband infrastructure and clean water initiatives. We need to do this. And in the meantime, we can put thousands and thousands of tradesmen to work. So it's about finding those resources and dedicating the specific projects. Thank you so much, Mr. Kucinich. Yes, I know about the Brent Spence Bridge. I've spent time studying the infrastructure needs of Hamilton County. Hamilton County is being cheated by the state of Ohio. 
It's one of the biggest uh, producers of state tax revenue, sends it to Columbus, and has trouble getting a fair share back. Here's what I intend to do. Number one, we're going to find the money. First of all, I promise, with respect to the Western Hills Viaduct, right after I take the oath of office, I'm going to go to Cincinnati, we'll break ground for the $360 million worth of improvements that are needed for the Western Hills Viaduct. Where am I going to get the money to start? From the Rainy Day Fund. Why the Rainy Day Fund? It's raining concrete from the Western Hills Viaduct. The Brent Spence Bridge, $2 billion. Now, the state may not be able to ante up the money for that, but what I intend to do is to take a bond issue to the people of Ohio to repair all of our bridges all over the state. Each billion dollars we spend will create 13,000 uh, jobs. We can move the economy of the state, we can repair our infrastructure statewide. All the people need, uh, need is leadership, right. and I'm ready to provide that. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Kucinich. Mr. Cordray, you have 60 seconds. Infrastructure is a crying need in the state of Ohio, and it's the kind of thing that state government can always put off because it can always be done tomorrow. But tomorrow comes and the infrastructure is crumbling, and that's where we've been now for years. When I was state treasurer, I agree with Dennis, we used bonded finance to improve our highways in this state. If we need to go to the people to have them s support infrastructure in the state, we will, and we can do that. We also need to push harder on the federal government. Donald Trump and the Congress spent a trillion and a half dollars on a tax bill that built nothing in this country. And they promised in the campaign infrastructure, and they haven't provided it. They're putting 200 billion up, and they're saying there has to be state and local match, and the rest is imaginary money that's gonna be provided by the private sector, and we haven't seen any of it. So what we need to do is to lead on this issue, to go to the people if necessary, to push on the federal government, and to prioritize the infrastructure in the state. It's good construction jobs in the state of Ohio. They won't be going anywhere. And it's the way we build this state and build the future of many people in this state. Thank you, Mr. Cordray. Now, I want to go to a question uh, from John from Miami University right now about the LGBTQ community. John? All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'd like to shift gears and, and ask each of the candidates about the our state laws protecting against discrimination. In a recent national report, the Human Rights Campaign ranked Ohio near the bottom for its current levels of legal protection for LGBTQ rights. As governor, uh, what changes to these laws would you support, if any, and, uh, and why? Mr. Schiavone, you have 60 seconds. Yeah, a lot of legislators in Columbus, they don't even talk about LGBTQ rights. Right? They don't even want to talk about it as if it doesn't exist. And so I've been fighting in the General Assembly to make sure that there's not di discrimination, to make sure that everybody has equal opportunities in the state of Ohio, and they're all treated the same. I mean, we're all human beings on this earth, and we have to get, get along, and we have to recognize that differences are okay. And we have to teach our young people that recognizing people's differences is incredibly important. And so as a leader, you need to stand out. And you have to lead by action. And that's the kind of stuff that I've done in the General Assembly when it comes to anti-discrimination pieces. Mr. Kucinich. Years ago when I was mayor of Cleveland, I had a policy where people were welcome to serve in my administration without regard to sexual orientation. I'm talking 40 years ago. As a member of Congress, I led the way. To, the, uh, to support the Employment Non-Discrimination Act. And as a presidential candidate, I was the first one years ago to stand up and, and support marriage equality. These are principles of what it means to be an American. Because as Americans, we believe in fairness, we believe in tolerance, we believe in compassion, and we believe in the authenticity of the expression of each person and as governor of the state of Ohio, I intend to see that every individual, no matter whether they're uh, LBGTQ, is entitled to respect, is entitled to employment opportunities, is entitled to equal pay, as in, and is entitled to participate in the governance of the state. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Cordray. 
So in answer to the question, we have a very specific piece of legislation in the legislature right now, and it's not going anywhere. It would ban discrimination based on sexual orientation in housing, in employment, and in public services. I strongly support that bill, and I will fight for that in the General Assembly. It is wrong that in Ohio today, you can marry publicly and immediately lose your job, or lose your housing, or lose access to public services because of that. The Republican Party in the state, mind you, it continues to fight a rear guard action against equality. They don't want to acknowledge gay marriage, and they don't want to acknowledge that people can have civil rights if they enter into a gay marriage. And it is wrong. It is backward looking and is holding the state back. The Chamber of Commerce has endorsed this legislation because they know companies are not going to want to come to Ohio from around the country if we don't stand for tolerant, inclusive, diverse communities that embrace the talents of everyone. That's what Betty Sutton and I will stand for, and we will fight for that in Columbus. Mr. Cordray, thank you. I now want to hand it back over to Curtis Fuller with, oh, forgive me, Mr. O'Neill. <laughs> forgive me, I'm jumping ahead. Thank you. You know, I, I just uh, had to look back in my history and realize that I was an assistant attorney general for the state of Ohio, and I represented the Ohio Civil Rights Commission in sexual harassment cases when Clarence Thomas was not on the Supreme Court of Ohio. That's how far back I go in that fight. I'm the former chairman of the Ashtabula County Fair Housing Board, and I can say now because I know we're being recorded, sexual orientation can never be the basis of disparate treatment for anyone, anywhere. Mr. O'Neill, thank you. Now, let's go to Curtis Fuller with our audience question. Curtis? All right, thanks a lot, Cherie. This is to Mr. Cordray, this question deals with your role, your former role, as head of the Federal Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, essentially going after companies for financial abuse. Uh, with that background, talk about what you would do, and if you're the right person for governor to entice co companies to bring their businesses here to Ohio. So I think you'll find if you talk to people around the country that I was an aggressive consumer watchdog, and make no apologies for that. And President Obama encouraged me in that work, and Elizabeth Warren encouraged me in that work, and both of them are encouraging me uh, in this campaign. In fact, Senator Warren is going to be here on Friday to support our campaign. She's doing that because she believes that I was tough but fair in that role. And I think people who saw my work saw that I was tough but fair, and a lot of them support me because they know that I will be tough but fair as a governor. And what I did was I stood up to some of the most powerful interests in this country, the big banks and the big financial institutions. And we put $12 billion back in people's pockets. Uh, we did that because they were treating people badly and people deserve, we all deserve fairness in the marketplace. That's everybody in this room, that's everybody in Ohio, it's everybody across the country. That's the work I did, I'm proud of it. I earned a lot of criticism and I consider that a badge of honor. Thank you. Mr. Cordray, thank you. I want to ask each of you, this is very quick, a quick 30 second uh, answer here. And how would you entice business to the state of Ohio? Mr. O'Neill, let's begin with you. I think if you have a business environment that encourages fairness for all, it has to start with the state having an interest in their people. That's why I am saying that the state of Ohio has become a hostile environment in mental health. It's become a hostile environment in education, which we're selling off to the highest bidder. I think you have to show people, if you want to come here, it's a great place to be, and we've got some work to do. Thank you. Mr. Savoni. 30 seconds. How do you entice business to Ohio? First, we have to clean up our natural assets. We have a beautiful lake on the top of the state and rivers throughout, and there been left behind because the state has not invested. So we have to make sure that we are investing in what we have. Then we have to invest in our people. So we have to invest in our tech schools. We have to invest in our two-year, four-year schools. We have to invest in trying to reverse brain drain so that we have our young people that want to stay here. And then businesses see that they have that pool of talent that they can come in and work with.
It's about investing in business incubators so that young people have ideas and can house those ideas, work with people in that same field, not have to pay rent, get free tech support, and then spin out of those incubators and start business of their own. Thank Grant you. programs specifically to startup companies and not just loans. I have to cut you off. Thank sure. you so much. Mr. Kucinich, 30 seconds. First of all, I intend to make sure we hold on to what we have, steel, automotive, aerospace, keep our primacy in manufacturing. Secondly, we need to have a health care plan. You know, in Canada, they subsidize their cars that are sold here $1,000 each because they have health care for all. I want health care for all. Businesses will find the cost of doing business in Ohio cheaper. I want to make sure we rebuild our infrastructure. I've talked about that. That gives businesses a reason to come in. I want to protect our water. Lake Erie and all of our water has to be protected, and we have to stop the fracking, which is poisoning our land. So by having clean water, rebuild infrastructure, health care for all, education for all, two-year free college, invest in our children, Ohio's going to be a place business will want to come to, and I'll be glad to lead the way towards that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cordray. I actually think that if we want to bring businesses to Ohio, we have to be a progressive state, and we have to stand proudly on progressive principles, because that's what will make this a state we can be proud of. It will be a state where companies want to come here and bring their workforce here, and it's a state where our young people will want to stay here rather than going somewhere else. Now, we have been backward for the last number of years on renewable energy and clean energy in this state. We need to move forward into the future. We've been backward, as I said, on equality and tolerance and diversity in this state. We need to move forward into the future. We've been backward on workforce development, making sure that our kids come out of school trained and ready to match to the jobs that are available. We have not done that. We need to do that more, more strongly. I also believe we should support our homegrown businesses here, our small businesses, and help them create jobs as I did when I was state treasurer and as we could do across Ohio. Right. This is all part of making the strong economic future that gives economic opportunity through all communities in this state. Mr. Cordray, thank you. Gentlemen, thank you. That concludes our questioning segment for tonight. I would now like to shift to our closing statements, and you will each have one minute for your closing statement. Mr. Schiavone, you will go first. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight with everybody. I realize that these guys are older than me, but they have a lot more hair every time they walked up in front of me. That kind of hurt my feelings. But I'm going to be honest. We need somebody different in order to lead this state, somebody that's going to t stop talking about all the things in the past, but talk about how we are going to get the Democratic base in a position where we can move forward and beat Mike DeWine. Because if we can't paint a contrast with Mike DeWine, then we don't win. And I'm the only candidate that can stand on stage with Mike DeWine and say, Mike DeWine is a career politician that has only done things in order to benefit himself and not the state and not be a hypocrite when I say that. So I'm asking people to come with me to help me to build this campaign. I've been traveling the state for a year and a half working on things and talking to people about what is important to them and putting together legislation and plans in order to get them done. People want somebody that is truthful, that is real, and will fight for them. And all my life I've been doing that, and as the next governor, I promise you that I'll continue down that path. Thank you for the opportunity Mr. tonight. Mr. Schiavone, thank you so much. Mr. Kucinich. Thank you, and thank you very much this evening to everyone who's made this possible. I want the young people of Ohio who are listening in to know that I'm with you as you march for your lives, knock for your lives, vote for your lives. We're going to lead the way to get rid of these assault weapons in Ohio because I'm, I hear you. I hear the, what your concerns are. I hear your concerns when you're alone in your classroom or in your, with your classmates thinking about your own safety. And I hear the parents. But we're going to go beyond that. I want people to imagine the kind of Ohio, four years from now, with the Kucinich administration, we will have led the way for health care for all, with all of your help. We will have led the way for two-year free college. We will begin rebuilding our infrastructure, $15 minimum wage. We'll make steps towards a, a universal pre-kindergarten. We'll straighten out these charter schools who are stealing from public education. There's a new Ohio waiting to be born. And with your help, go to kucinich.com. It will be. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.
Mr. Cordray, you have one minute for your closing statement. So, so I can't agree with what Joe said, that anybody on this stage is a hypocrite. I think everybody means well, and they're putting forward plans that they think will improve Ohio. One question is, are those plans practical and achievable? And who has a record of real results of getting things done? Uh, I have helped small businesses create jobs in this state, and we can do much more of that if I am governor. I help thousands of people save their homes for, from, from foreclosure, and whatever threats there are to the people of Ohio, I will stand strongly in their corner and fight for them, just as I fought for them at the Consumer Bureau. It wasn't just on behalf of other Americans, it was on behalf of every Ohioan. And I have sought to make sure that in government, we work for the people and that we lift up the people. And that's what I will do. That's why we put forward plans to help small businesses create jobs, plans to address the opioid crisis, plans to reduce the gun violence, and plan today for free community college, which we need in this state. These are things that will move us into the future. That's what I stand for. Betty Sutton and I will govern this state to set an example for America of how we can stand, not just for some of us, but for all of us. Join us to fulfill that vision. Mr. Thank Cordray, you. thank you. Mr. O'Neill. I've only got a minute, so I'll direct you to O'NeillForGovernor.org and you can read all about it. What a privilege to be here tonight. Look at the candidates that the Democratic Party has put on this stage. The next governor of Ohio is going to be a Democrat. There's no question about that. The reason I left the Supreme Court to be in this race is because my heart was broken by 5,000 people dying per year that could be solved. My heart was broken when I found out that we had sold our prison system to the profiteers and they were going, you know, they're, they're costing us $100 million a year to do nothing of value. My heart was broken when I, when I realized that the school system that built the great state of Ohio has been sold to the profiteers. It is time for the Democrats of Ohio to demand of our candidates, me included, plans. I'm saying legalize marijuana, build mental health hospitals, and, and open those prisons from those nonviolent people. More hospitals, less prisons. Thank you. Mr. O'Neill, thank you. This concludes our debate for this evening. We'd like to thank all of our candidates for being here and taking time. I know you've been crisscrossing Ohio. Uh, we appreciate you being here tonight and taking the time to face one another and to talk with our audience and try to enlighten us on where you stand on the issues. Also need to thank our partners here with us tonight, the Ohio Democratic Party, Dr. John Foran from Miami University, along with Michael Pittman and the Journal News, and of course our very own WLWT News 5's Curtis Fuller taking our audience questions. I also have to give a special thanks to Miami University for helping us put on this great event this evening and helping us for weeks and weeks. It's more than just an hour debate. We've been planning for weeks for this. So thank you so much to them. For now, I'm Sheree Palello. Have a great evening.